welcome back to this uh, lecture series on pulse width modulation for power electronic converters. We have been looking at various modules as part of this course. We had an overview of power electronic converters and looked at the applications of voltage source converters. Then we looked at certain low switching frequency PWM and in the last couple of modules we were looking at uh, the PWM generation when the switching frequency is fairly higher than the uh, fundamental or the modulation frequency. And in the triangle comparison methods we looked at the sine triangle PWM and third harmonic injection methods and uh, uh, various bus clamping PWM methods. In the space vector pairs PWM also we saw the same similar me methods and also the advanced bus clamping PWM method where uh, you know one phase switches while another phase switches at twice the nominal frequency. And now in this module this is after the 6 modules in this 7th module we have been looking at uh, the line current triple. How the earlier modules focused on how do you generate PWM. When you generate PWM you are controlling the fundamental voltage. You know that fundamental voltage it is not just fundamental there are also harmonic components there and they produce harmonic currents. And uh, we have been trying to see you know uh, the, the, so the all these harmonic currents produce what is called as a ripple current. So, we are trying to uh, see if we can evaluate the armus. Uh, the current ripple and that is what we have been doing in this uh, module. And then as part of this module we looked at a few things like reviewing all this various PWM methods such as conventional space vector PWM, sine triangle, bus clamping and advanced bus clamping PWM methods. And we looked at the DC bus utilization of all these methods now given a DC bus voltage how much AC voltage can be obtained here and we saw that in most of the methods like conventional space vector PWM or bus clamping PWM or advanced bus clamping PWM methods you can produce about 15 percent higher AC voltage than fine triangle PWM with the same DC bus voltage now. We also had a look at the harmonic spectra and uh, what this and so on and we generally found that you know all these PWM methods resulted in side bands around integral multiples of switching frequencies. And the harmonic model of an induction motor is basically its leakage inductance and uh, uh, we determined uh, the you know uh, uh, looked at certain performance uh, metrics and one of the performance metrics is basically is uh, total harmonic distortion factor. And we are looking at instead of doing all this in the frequency domain we have been doing it in the time domain. We are looking at the error voltage vector that is if you look at it in the space vector point of view what you need to do is to apply three phase voltage that is a revolving vector. It is a revolving vector of uniform magnitude is need to be applied. But what you apply is one of those seven vectors produced by uh, the inverter which is not the same as what you want. There is a difference between what you want and what you apply and therefore, there is an error. And this error voltage vector is integrated to get your state of flux ripple vector. This is what we saw in the last uh, lecture and we were trying to estimate this RMS line current ripple. This integral of this error voltage vector or the state of flux ripple is just proportional to this current ripple and we were trying to evaluate this RMS line current ripple over a particular sub cycle. So, in this time what we will do is we will we will quickly review the state of flux ripple and the RMS line current ripple and we will look at uh, you know go further and study the influence of various switching sequences on RMS current ripple and how do we come up with hybrid PWM techniques to reduce this current ripple. These hybrid PWM techniques involve multiple switching sequences now. So, this lecture is specifically on analysis and design of PWM techniques from line current ripple perspective. So, we are going to look at the you know line current ripple produced by different PWM methods. Of course, the first PWM method we will be considering is conventional space vector PWM which we did last class and we will quickly go through that and then we will go on to the other PWM methods namely the bus clamping and the advanced bus clamping PWM methods we will we'll consider. So, we will do an analysis and we will try to find out uh, how these methods compare in terms of how RMS line current ripple can be evaluated in these methods and how they compare and we try and design some hybrid PWM methods which will reduce the line current ripple which is a hybrid PWM or even as I mentioned now that implies methods which use more than one switching sequences now right. So, this is the voltage source inverter that we have been talking about two devices in each three legs and so two devices in each leg and uh, these are the uh, AC side terminals and these are the two DC side terminals and uh, it is connected to a load like this there is a three phase star connected load but the neutral point n is not connected anywhere particularly. And so, whenever you know the, in, the, the inverter is in the so called 0 state all the top devices are on or all the bottom devices are on all these are shorted and therefore, V r n, V y n and V b n are all equal to 0. And in any of the active states one of the phases say V r n could be plus 2 V d c by 3 while V y n and V b n could be minus V d c by 3. Otherwise, so one of the three phases could be minus 2 V d c by 3 and the other two could be plus V d c by 3. So, these are the kind of three phase voltages 
an inverter applies on this kind of load. And when those three phase voltages are transformed into voltage vectors, this is what you get now. So, there are six active vectors, active states and they produce active vectors and the two zero states produce this null vector now. And in the space vector PWM, we have a revolving reference vector, we sample it once in every sub cycle duration T s and try to produce an average voltage vector equal to that sample. Now, let us say this is the sample, this sample falls in the so called sector 1, which is uh, within vector 1 and vector 2. So, you produce this vector by time averaging the null vector, vector 1 and vector 2. You apply vector 1 for T 1 seconds and vector 2 for T 2 seconds and the null vector for the remaining T z seconds to produce this average voltage vector. You do this similarly in different sub cycles. So, to do that average voltage vector, this is how you calculate the dwell times, we discussed this in the last quite a few lectures now. right? So, we are looking at particularly as conventional space vector PWM, where you start applying one zero state and then you switch and go to the first active state and then the second active state and from there you go to the other zero state. This is you do in one sub cycle or half carrier cycle. In the other sub cycle or half carrier cycle, you come the reverse way. So, the red lines indicate the sequence in one carrier cycle and the blue lines in the other carrier cycle and these two alternate. This is what happens in a conventional space vector PWM and not just that the time for which this 0 and 7 are applied are equal. So, this is applied for some T z by 2 seconds, this is for T 1 seconds, this is for T 2 seconds and this is again T z by 2 seconds. Right. So, when you do this what happens there is always an error vector. What you want is this V reference vector, but what you apply is sometimes null vector, sometimes vector 1, sometimes vector 2. When you are applying null vector for example, the error is minus V reference vector is the error now. So, you are applying 0, 1, 2, 7 which we considered last time and when you are applying that your error voltage vector is minus V ref vector and you go about integrating that it grows in this direction as indicated here. At this instant at 0.5 T z you switch from the 0 vector to the active vector 1 and therefore, now your error voltage vector is like this and the tip of this state of flux ripple vector now starts moving parallel to this error voltage vector. There is some drawing inaccuracy here, these two are actually parallel lines. So, it goes parallelly, this goes on till 0.5 T z plus T 1. At this instant what do you do? You switch from active vector 1 to active vector 2 and therefore, the error voltage vector now changes and this is the error voltage vector and therefore, the tip of the state of flux ripple vector starts moving in this direction and reaches here at the instant 0.5 T z plus T 1 plus T 2 and finally, it is now time to apply the last 0 state plus plus plus. So, you switch there and your reference vector is once again minus V ref and as it goes on at the end of the sub cycle, the tip of the flux ripple vector comes back to 0 now. So, this has certain RMS value, this is the proportional to the current uh, ripple and it has certain RMS value which is what we are trying to find out. So, a good way to do that is actually to break it up into the d axis component and the q axis component and then go about doing that. Here we just found that you know if you if you divide the t 0 and t 7 little differently not exactly 0.5 and 0.5. Let us say this is 0.4 t z and this is 0.6 t z what you would get is indicated by the other dashed line. So, what happens is the same triangle the origin is kind of shifted here and uh, this actually affects the q axis ripple a little and uh, the equal division is actually better in terms of the harmonic uh, RMS uh, current ripple point of view. Here you will see that these both are ripple, they are equal. In this case, this is lower well that is higher. So, that actually means the, this peak value is higher and the overall RMS Q axis ripple in this case would be higher. So, this is something we said last time why sine triangle PWM compared to sine triangle PWM conventional space vector PWM is better. Uh, for actually conventional when you divide them by equal division the harmonic performance improves and it is nearly optimal. It is not exactly optimal that is sometimes you can divide it in some ratio other than 0 0.5 0 0.5 to get a better performance, but that is the improvement you get is not very much. So, you can say that equal division of null vector time is kind of close to optimal though it is actually suboptimal. Fine. So, this is about dividing the vector between the two let us say you divide it equally only and then you go about doing that. In this case what happens? you have a q axis component and you have the d axis component as we did last time now. So, this is the state of flux ripple vector that is reproduced here now and this is the q axis and this is the d axis. So, this is the origin. So, from here it grows in this triangular trajectory now. right? So, what happens to the d axis ripple? When the 0 state 0 is applied the d axis ripple does not change. Similarly, when 0 state 7 is applied it does not change and it is equal to 0. In between when active state 1 
and 2 are applied, when 1 is applied the d axis ripple grows like this and when 2 is applied it comes back at the end of this duration it comes back to 0 right. And what happens to the q axis ripple? It is 0 and it goes negative. So, initially it goes negative to what we call as 0.5 times q z and where q z is minus v ref into t z. And from there when you apply this active state 1 it goes about increasing it crosses 0 somewhere and it goes to value 0.5 q z plus q 1. Then when active state 2 is applied it continues to rise, but not at a very high rate you remember this is for a particular value of v reference vector these kinds of figures will differ for different values of v reference vector. We have considered a particular value of v reference vector and for that we are getting this kind of thing this is just for purpose of illustration now. So, it increases now at the end of t at the end of this interval you apply the 0 state and your q z goes negative it goes back to 0. So, you have the d axis ripple in the first and the fourth sub intervals it is equal to 0 in the second sub interval it increases in the third it falls whereas, the q axis interval changes in all the four sub intervals like this and what do we want to do? We want to find out the RMS value that is you need to get this mean square value and the mean square value of that and add the 2 to get the overall mean square value. So, how will you get the mean square value for this? If you, this is the d axis ripple shown in red ink. So, you square it psi d tilde squared what you get is you get this kind of parabola. So, this, there are parabolic sections now the same way the q axis ripple which is a piecewise linear function this is a straight line this is a straight line this is a straight line this is a straight line. And when you integrate when you square that up it becomes parabolic this is one parabola this is section of another parabola this is one section of another parabola this is one section of another parabola. So, you if you have to square and integrate that you basically have to evaluate the areas under these parabolic sections. So, how do you calculate the areas under these parabolic sections if you consider let us say a straight line passing through the origin and you square that what you get is you get a parabola like this which is of the form y is equal to k x squared. If you have this of the form y is equal to k x squared and you consider this area this shaded area what is that shaded area you have this o a b c you consider this rectangle and it is one third of the area of this rectangle. It is very easy to see that because y equals x square or k x square you integrate that it becomes k x cube by 3. So, this represents k x squared and this is x or x. So, you know the, the area is uh, k x cube by 3 or k x 1 cube by 3 if you are considering x is equal to x 1 and one third of that area. So, this is so this parabola's area is one third of that this is something we saw it is a very very elementary idea and we do this now. And not only when you have a straight line passing through this let us say you have a straight line passing through some other point like this when you square that what happens it becomes a parabola what kind of parabola it is a parabola with two real roots. So, it is a parabola that just sits on the horizontal axis it has two real roots and they are equal it sits on this now. So, you can consider a parabola like this which has been obtained by squaring a line straight line which passes through this point. So, now if you are looking at this area shaded area this area is once again equal to one third of the area under this rectangle excuse me is the area under one third of this rectangle. So, this is something we looked at last class also and this is there is a quick proof for this. Now, if you are considering a line x 1 to x 2 you want to square this uh, linear section between x 1 and x 2 and find out the area under that. So, this is m x plus c you are squaring that m x plus c the whole square you are integrating x 1 to x 2 with respect to d x. So, when you do that you get m x plus c the whole cube divided by 3 m this is what and you are going to evaluate the intervals between x is equal to x 1 and x is equal to x 2. So, it is same as saying that it is 1 by 3 m times it is m x plus c is nothing but y therefore, it is y 2 cube minus y 1 cube and therefore, you have this relationship y 2 minus y 1 by 3 m multiplied by y 2 square plus y 2 y 1 plus y 1 square. So, you have one factor which is y 2 square plus y 2 y 1 plus y 1 square and the other factor is y 2 minus y 1 by m 3 m that becomes x 2 minus x 1 by 3. So, this gives the area under that parabola if I have a straight line passing through x 1 y 1 x 2 y 2 and I want to square that and find the area under that then this is what gives that area. So, this you can see this in this particular reference which I mentioned it even in the last lecture. Uh, so, an MSc engineering thesis by Mr. Pawan Kumar Hari on comparative evaluation of space vector based pulse width modulation techniques in terms of harmonic distortion switching loss uh, submitted to the Indian Institute of Science in 2008. So, this is uh, you know you can find more I mean the same thing in, in a more detailed fashion in case you need a reference here all right. So, now let us say when you want to square this what happens now let us go about further with the calculation now. Here it is simple based on whatever we said 
this area the square and the area under this 1 by 3 times d square times t 1 plus t 2 and we want the mean square value and therefore, we are dividing it by t s and d here as I said is v d c sin theta s into t 1 as we talked about before. Let us say we go ahead with this all right. So, this is what it is and if you look at the q axis ripple there are 4 sub intervals. Let us look at the first sub interval what happens the sub first sub interval we found that it was going negative if you square that it is it is something like this now. So, if this is 0.5 q z square this is 0.5 q z the whole square and the shaded area is 1 by 3 times 0.5 q z the whole square multiplied by 0.5 t z and you divide it by t z just for the purpose of evaluating the mean va square value right. So, that is there therefore, that is divided by t 1. So, you have got some q 1 which is basically the area under the shaded curve divided by t s right. Then you have this second in sub interval 0.5 q z to I mean from where it rises from 0.5 q z to 0.5 q z plus q 1. In this interval you get this is 0.5 q z the whole square plus 0.5 q z multiplied by 0.5 q z plus q 1 and 0.5 q z plus q 1 the whole square. So, this whole thing divided by you know you know multiplied by t 1 by 3 is the shaded area and you are dividing it by t s for you to evaluate the mean square value right. So, this is let us call it as q 2 and look at the third sub interval and during the third sub interval it varies linearly this is as shown here and during this time similarly you can evaluate q 3 which is you square it and you find out the area under that and q 3 is that area divided by t s. So, you can write down this expression as we did last time. So, then this is the fourth only thing left is the fourth sub interval and this part if you square and you are going to get a parabolic section you can evaluate the area under that and that divided by t s. So, there should be a t s here. Um, so, this is going to be a t s here yeah. So, that is going to be q 4 now. So, then what do you get is for to calculate the RMS state of flux ripple let me say I have my f d squared this is the d axis this is what 1 by 3 times d squared t 1 plus t 2 divided by t s as I did before. And this f this is the mean square value along the d axis and what is f q square that is whatever we calculate as q 1 plus q 2 plus q 3 plus q 4 it is a long expression and you know we found them in 4 different steps q 1, q 2, q 3, q 4 now. So, let me call this as let me add s u b to this base what do you mean by s u b I mean a sub cycle. So, this is the RMS value I mean the mean square value of d axis ripple and the mean square value of q axis ripple. Now, the mean square ripple over the sub cycle itself can be given by the sum of the mean square value along the d axis and the mean square value along the q axis this is what you have. So, this completes the procedure for evaluating the RMS state of flux ripple over a sub cycle. So, you consider that you consider the error voltage vector and then you get the d axis and the q axis components and square them up and uh, get the area under them and you know evaluate the mean square value along the d axis mean square value along the q axis sum them up to get the mean square ripple. So, the whole thing under a square root would give you this f sub f sub is the RMS value f sub square is the mean square value. So, I have written the mean square value right. So, if you want to say f sub what you need to do here is you just have to say f sub is the whole thing under square root. So, you have this f d sub squared plus f q sub squared under root is that now. So, this is the procedure for calculating the RMS state flux ripple. So, now, so now let us little bit more quantitative let us look at what is what now all these things now let us say 1 by 3 times d square t 1 plus t 2 this involves d t 1 and t 2 and then you have q 1 q 2 q 3 q 4 all these things involve certain things like you know q 1 q 2 q z etcetera and t 1 t 2 t z etcetera now. So, let us take a look at what are those values. So, let us say you have these t 1 t 2 and t z are the dwell times So this is the dwell time of active state 1 active state 2 and the null state. If you take active state 1 what is that you can see that it is a function of v reference that is the magnitude of the reference vector and alpha see I am I, I just used the theta s a little before and now I am using alpha. So, please do not mind the uh, inconsistency I mean here I basically mean this is the angle of the reference vector now or which which I called as theta s in the 
previous lecture all right. So, V ref sin 60 minus alpha by V dc sin 16 to T s. So, you can see that the dwell time the time for which the active vector 1 is applied is a function of V ref alpha and T s. And similarly, the time for which the second vector is applied is also a function of V ref alpha and T s and T z is just T s minus T 1 minus T 2 and that is also a function of V ref alpha and T s. And how about these quantities q z what is this q z minus v ref multiplied by t z what is minus v ref you have the null vector and when the null vector is applied you have certain error voltage vector this is the q axis component of the error voltage vector and the q axis component of the error voltage vector is minus v ref minus v ref multiplied by t z is what we call as q z this is a volt second quantity error volt second quantity right this q 1 is another error volt second quantity corresponding to the active state 1 along the q axis right. So, what is that when active state 1 is applied V d c active state 1 active vector 1 has a magnitude V d c and its its q axis component is V d c cos alpha the reference vector is at an angle alpha the q axis is at an angle alpha and therefore, the component of the applied vector along the q axis is V d c cos alpha and this is what you want is V ref. So, what is applied is V d c cos alpha what you want is V ref and the difference between the two the error between the two is V d c cos alpha minus V ref. So, this is error voltage this is the error q axis voltage this is the error voltage along the q axis when active vector 1 is applied and this multiplied by T 1 is Q 1 Q 1 is error volt second quantity corresponding to active state 1 along the q axis. Again Q 2 is uh, another error volt second quantity which corresponds to uh, the active state 2 when active state 2 is applied the vector has a magnitude V d c but the q axis is at an angle 60 minus alpha with respect to that. So, V d c cos 60 minus alpha is the applied q axis component the, the component of the applied uh, vector along the q axis is V d c cos 60 minus alpha this is what is applied and what is required is V ref and the error between the two is what is given here V d c cos 60 minus alpha minus V ref. So, this is the error voltage along the q axis when active state 2 is applied and that is applied for a duration equal to T 2 and so this is a volt second quantity corresponding to active state 2 right. So, and D is similarly the error volt second quantity along the uh, D axis. So, let us say when 1 is applied the error volt second is V d c sin alpha. So, V d c sin alpha multiplied by T 1 this is also equal to V d c sin 60 minus alpha multiplied by T 2 right. So, you can see that Q z Q 1 Q 2 D are all functions of V ref alpha and T s. So, these are also so they are they depend on V ref alpha and the dwell times the dwell times are again functions of V ref alpha and T s therefore, you can say Q z Q 1 Q 2 and D are also functions of V ref and alpha and therefore, all these that you have here F D sub squared or F Q sub squared all of them are functions of V reference alpha and T s and therefore, the whole thing that you have here this is the RMS state of flux ripple over a sub cycle is actually a function of V ref alpha and T s. So, what is V ref it is the magnitude of the applied voltage vector what is F sub it is the RMS state of flux ripple or MI which is equivalent to the RMS current ripple over a sub cycle that is over a half carrier cycle and this is a, a function of the reference magnitude you have the reference vector V ref is the magnitude of the reference vector what is angle alpha alpha is the angle of the reference vector measured from the starting of that sector boundary in this case it is measured from vector V 1 and what is T s T s is the sub cycle duration therefore, you can say that the RMS current ripple or the the RMS state of flux ripple is actually proportional is a function of V ref alpha and T s now what exactly is that this is more generic something more specific is given here this is the form of that function F sub you will find is proportional to T s you see is proportional to T s that, that is what you say the RMS state of flux ripple or current ripple is proportional to T s makes sense right you reduce the switching frequency let us say half the switching frequency what happens your sub cycle duration doubles and therefore, the RMS current ripple doubles or you reduce your switching frequency to half therefore, now what happens you are uh, you know uh, uh, you double the switching frequency if you double the switching frequency the sub cycle duration becomes half and therefore, the RMS current ripple is half. Therefore, you can see that this sub cycle this the RMS current ripple over a sub cycle is proportional to the sub cycle duration if you increase that this increases if you decrease that this decreases and your switching frequency is nothing but the reciprocal of 2 T s in the case of conventional space vector P w m. So, you find this here now. So, it is it is proportional to T s. So, that is its dependence on T s. How is its dependence on V ref and alpha? It is actually a polynomial in V ref under square root. 
it is something like c naught v ref square plus c 1 v ref cube plus c 2 v ref power 4, it is like a polynomial under square root and the c o, c 1 and c 2 are all functions of alpha. So, and these are functions of alpha what I should say is they are different for different sequences now that is what is the difference I am just going to tell you now. So, in some cases c naught could turn out to be a constant whereas, for some switching sequence c naught is a function of alpha. So, you can actually calculate that you consider sequences one by one which we will do a little later that is you know we will consider the different sequences and uh, get an idea of how these could be done. So, all these are actually functions of sequences. So, now let me say here this is c naught if I am considering conventional it will be something like c naught 0 1 2 7 or it will be c naught 0 1 2 or c naught 0 1 2 1 these are various sequences. Similarly, c 1 you will have some coefficient c 1 for 0 1 2 7 this coefficient will be a different function of alpha if you consider the sequence 0 1 2 again it will be different if you consider another sequence 0 1 2 1. Similarly, c 2 of alpha it is also a function of a trigonometric function of alpha all these are trigonometric functions of alpha excuse me. So, this is again you can consider them different for different sequences they are c 2 you can say 0 1 2 there is c 2 for 0 1 2 1 all these are different now. So, in general you can call this as c o sequence and you can call this as c 1 sequence and this is c 2 sequence as these coefficients differ from one switching sequence to the other that is we have considered the conventional switching sequence till now what we have considered is 0 1 2 7. So, for that you will get some c o c 1 and c 2 which are trigonometric functions of alpha instead of 0 1 2 7 if you consider 0 1 2 you will get some different c 0 some or c 1 for example a different function of trigonometric function of alpha this will be again a different trigonometric function of alpha from what is that right. So, let us look at those various things if you if you need a you know and actually this reference is useful if you want to do the derivations and all that you can find the details here the same MS engineering thesis which I by Pawan Kumar Hari which I mentioned a while back right. So, let us take a quick recap at the switching sequences which we did a few lectures back. So, because we are going to look at the various switch sequences and their effect on the RMS current ripple. So, let us say you consider the sequence 0 1 2 that is you do not apply this 0 state 7 for the entire null vector time T z you apply only 1 0 state and that is minus 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 or 0. So, you stay here for t z seconds and go here stay here for t 1 seconds and switch y phase and go here stay here for t 2 seconds that is the end of sub cycle. Then you come back switch y phase come here again here come here. So, the red indicates the switching sequence in one half carrier cycle or sub cycle the blue indicates the switching sequence in the other carrier cycle these two alternate uh, in your sector 1 all right. So, they alternate this is one clamping sequence where only 0 state 0 is used. Another clamping sequence is where this 0 state minus 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 is not at all used, but plus 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 is used this is for the entire duration T z. So, this is T z and then you switch B phase and you go here and they stay here for T 2 seconds and then you switch Y phase and go here for T 1 seconds. So, T z T 2 and T 1 again you go back in the reverse direction stay here for T 1 seconds switch Y phase go here stay here for T 2 seconds switch B phase and go here and stay here for T z seconds. So, this is a state where you know there is another clamping in the previous case plus 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 is never used you see minus 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 plus minus minus and plus plus minus B phase is negative B phase is negative B phase is negative. So, the B phase is always clamped to the negative bus in the next case it is plus 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 minus and plus minus minus. So, the R phase is always positive. So, here the R phase is clamped to the positive DC bus. So, these are called clamping sequences. And similarly, we also discuss double switching clamping sequences which are used in the advanced bus clamping PWM. So, you can say 0 you can apply the 0 for the entire T z and from here go for T 1 by 2 seconds go to vector 2 apply for T 2 seconds and come back and apply for T 1 by 2 second. So, it is 0 1 2 1 similarly in the reverse what you do 1 2 1 0. So, this is what you can do this is one variety of double switching clamping sequence. Another variety of uh, double switching clamping sequence are its complementary one is where you use the other 0 state you go 7 2 1 2 you apply 7 for duration T z 2 for duration T 2 by 2 and 1 for duration T 1 and uh, again 2 for duration T 2 by 2. So, 7 2 1 2 the reverse would be 2 1 2 7. So, once again you can do this. So, there are also switching sequences 1 0 1 2 and 2 7 2 1 which I am not 
talking about now, I have discussed this before now. So, now let us say why should the switching sequence influence the RMS state of flux ripple or the RMS current ripple over a sub cycle now. What we are considering? We are considering a particular sub cycle and we are considering the same reference voltage vector. That reference voltage vector say something like VRF is equal to 0.75 and alpha is equal to 10 degrees or 15 degrees is considered. So, the same reference vector you are using different switching sequences. So, what do you do is basically the voltage vectors are applied in different sequences. So, sometimes it may be 0, 1, 2, 7 or 0, 1, 2, 1. Therefore, the inverter's voltage vector is applied in different sequences. That is, the instantaneous applied voltage vector differs with switching sequence. So, when the instantaneous applied voltage vector differs, the reference vector is the same. Therefore, the error is applied minus reference. Since the applied is changing, the instantaneous error voltage vector also differs with switching sequence. If you use 0, 1, 2, 7, you will get some in error voltage vector as a function of time. If you use 0, 1, 2, 1 or let us say 7, 2, 1, 2, you will get another er er you know error voltage vector as a, in a different function of time. So, the instantaneous error voltage vector changes differs with the switching sequence used and therefore, it is integral, integral of this is the state of flux ripple vector that also differs for different switching sequences and therefore, you get the RMS uh, uh, current ripple over a sub cycle changes and when the RMS current ripple over sub cycle changes naturally the RMS current ripple over the entire fundamental cycle should change now. So, let us just bring that out now. So, here we are going to look at the state of flux ripple vector for clamping sequences 0, 1, 2 and 7, 2, 1 like what we did before we had this sequence now let us say we, we did this for sequences 0 1 2 7. So, the same thing let us now do for plus minus minus this is 1 and this is plus plus minus this is we call as 2 minus 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 is 0 and plus 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 this is 7. So, these are the inverter states in sector 1 now what we do is let us say we are looking at a reference vector like this this is the reference vector that we want to produce. It has a magnitude VRF and it has an angle alpha. This angle alpha I have also called theta s sometime before. So, it is angle alpha theta s whatever it may be. So, I am going to now we earlier looked at how the ripple vary I mean varies for conventional sequence. So, now I am going to consider now I am going to consider sequence 0 1 2 and 7 to 1 ok. So, now let me take sequence 0 1 2. So, this is the q axis and I am considering the d axis to be here now alright. When I apply 0 1 2, so what happens I get 0 is applied like this. So, it changes like this. When I apply this vector 0, the error is minus v reference vector this is the error minus v reference vector and therefore, it grows here and I come to this here in the instant t z I come here. And after that you know after 0 I am applying 1 and then I would apply 2. So, when I am applying 1 and the 1 is applied for a fairly long duration I am sorry it, it is I am applying 1 for a fairly longer duration. So, let me just redo this ok. So, when I apply 2, when I apply active vector 1, it is may be like this and when I apply active vector 2, it is parallel to this line which I would say is like here. So, when my active vector 1 will take me up to this point and this is my active vector 2. So, this is what the stator flux ripple vector. So, this is the psi tilde vector, the stator flux ripple vector. It is 0 to start with, 0 to start with, excuse me. So, and it goes on increasing along the q axis when the null vector is applied, and after that, its tip moves parallel to the error here, and after that, its tip moves parallel to this error corresponding to this error voltage vector 2, and it goes back to the origin. So, let me also write down the other instance of time here this is T z this is T z plus T 1 here it is back to T s. So, this is the nature of variation you can see it is different from what it was with the conventional space vector P w m. So, anyway let us just contrast it with something else 
that is contrasted with 721. When you are applying 721, what is going to happen? It is the same movement that you will see when active vector 7 is applied. It is because it is also a 0 vector, it is applied for a duration T z now. Then you are going to apply this active vector 2. So, this moves parallel to the active vector 2, this moves parallel to this now, this is active vector 2. Then what happens? This is the instant T z plus T 2. After that what happens? You are going to apply the active vector 1 and therefore, this vector will move parallel to this and come back to the origin. This is 1. So, you can see that there is a difference now. So, this is 0 1 to 1 here also you apply the 0 state and then 1 and 2 here you apply the 0 vector you first apply the active vector 2 and then active vector 1 that is the essential difference now. Do you see a difference here? So, if you say 0 1 to 1 the first one difference that is along the d axis that you can see that if it is 0 1 2 next if you consider a 2 1 0 it will go along the other way. So, it will go in the alternate directions as far as the d axis ripple is concerned. What I am saying is if you consider 0 1 2 the d axis ripple is positive in this sub cycle. If you consider the next sub cycle when it will be 2 1 0 the d axis ripple will be negative and so on. So, that is not a very important thing now, but if you see the act the 0 vector is applied after the 0 vector the active vector 1 is applied and active vector 2 is applied here these after the 0 vector active vector 2 is applied then only active vector 1 is applied now. So, what is the difference you can see? Now, in both the cases you can see that the q axis ripple is varying excuse me is varying it's 0 it goes to some value in both the cases. Then what happens in the case of 0 1 2 the q axis ripple starts falling quickly it comes at a much faster rate. What happens in the 7 to 1 case the q axis ripple is more or less at the same value or rather it actually goes on increasing a little. So, while here the q axis ripple is very low and from there it is falling to 0. On the other hand when you with 7 to 1 you find that the q axis ripple is very high and it gradually falls down lower. Do you get that? So, let me just plot that out. So, let me just take this once again and plot the two different q axis ripples alone. How do that? In the, in the, in the first case let us say we, uh, let me use a red ink as I did before. So, the q axis ripple is like this. Then the next t 1 what happens it goes here and it goes slightly positive and then t z. So, over t 2 it comes like this. So, this is interval t z this is I am sorry this is interval t 1 this is interval t 2 this is not there mm, yeah all right. If I take the other one here t z is the same then here what happens is instead of it is going down it, it is like this it increases in the negative direction and finally, it goes back to origin. So, this is the case of I am sorry 7 2 1 and this is the case of 0 1 2. So, you can see that in case of 7 to 1 the q axis ripple is more if q corresponding to 7 to 1 is greater than f q corresponding to 0 1 2. So, the d axis ripple both of them have the same peak values. So, you can see that both of them have the same peak values along the d axis and uh, since they have the same they have the same RMS values also. The difference is of the q axis ripple. The q axis ripple pertaining to 7 to 1 is greater than the q axis ripple pertaining to 0 1 2. When is that? You can see that whenever VRF is closer to active vector 1 whenever this is, this is alpha is equal to 30 degree whenever it is within that you will always get that to be higher than that. So, I can actually summarize it like what I mean I can say this way that is f 0 1 2 is less than f 7 2 1 for alpha less than 30 degrees where alpha is the angle of the reference vector and I can say that f 7 2 1 is less than f 0 1 2 for 30 to 60 alpha coming between 30 and 60 degrees now. So, this is a difference between the two clamping sequences and therefore, you get this cor corresponding differences between various PWM methods. Now, you have 60 degree clamping PWM method you consider the sector 1 it is 7 to 1. So, what happens is null vector and after the null vector the dominant vector is active vector 1 and active vector 2 is not so dominant. 
So, the null vector is followed by here and then here. So, in this case the current ripple is a little higher. The same way the current ripple is also little higher here. This is so 60 degree clamp gives the highest THD. This gives the highest THD among the highest THD among all the bus clamping PWM methods because it has the worst of the two employed. Why? It has the worst of the two. 7 to 1 is worse of the two in the first half, 0 1 2 is the worst of the two. So, it, it, it gives the highest THD among the bus clamping PWM. On the other hand, you go to 30 degree clamp, it use 0 1 2 is the, is the better of the two in the first 30 degree, 7 to 1 is again the better of the two in the next 30 degree and therefore, this is the lowest THD among BCPWM techniques. So, such that you can see this this error voltage analysis, the analysis based on this state of flux ripple or this integral of error voltage vector gives you some idea as to what exactly you can expect now. You can actually do all this quantitatively though I you know I am just because of uh, you know constraints here I am only indicating the procedure as to how exactly you can do this now. The same way if you want to do such an analysis for uh, let us say this um, uh, current ripple vector corresponding to sequence 0 1 2 and 0 1 2 1 and 7 2 1 2. Let us say you want to do this now. The same way you can start off consider a same similar reference vector. Let us say so this is minus minus minus, this is plus minus minus that is active state 1, this is plus plus minus active state 2. Here it is plus 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 or 7, here you have minus 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 or 0. So, you are considering let us say a reference vector like here. This is the reference vector V reference and this is the angle alpha now. Okay. So, these are the errors. Okay. So, what you can do is you can consider let us say the d axis and the q axis, this is the q axis and let us say this is the d axis. So, this is the origin now. Okay. So, let me consider sequence 0 1 2 1. So, when I do 0 1 2 1, what happens first during the initial t z interval at null vector 0 is applied therefore, the error is minus and therefore, I will get just like this now. Then it is 1, what will happen? I, my movement will be like this and then when it is 2, I will move parallel to this and 1 will bring me back to this now. So, what will exactly happen is, so this is when I have 1 and this is when I have 2, this is when I have 2 and finally, this is back to 1. This might be a little confusing, so I will explain this again to you. So, when I am applying the first what I am applying is 0, state 0. So, when I am doing that the error vector is minus V ref along the q axis and therefore, this grows like this that is why there is an arrow mark and this is for 0 it grows like this now. This is the time instant T z now. After that what happens we are applying the active state 1 during the time the error volt second is like this and it actually moves parallel to this uh, error voltage vector. So, it moves like this and here this reaches at this instant this instant is T z plus T 1 by 2 and this instant is T z plus T 1 by 2 plus T 2 and here it is back to T s. So, what you really get is a double triangular trajectory, you get a double triangular trajectory here, here it goes back up and back here. So, you, you get it like this now, this is 0 1 2 1 now. So, you can see that this kind of sequence has a good advantage in terms of the d axis ripple. The d axis ripple is lower in this case compared to the conventional which we will look at it a little later now. The same way if you consider 7 to 1 2 for example. So, 7 to 1 2 what will happen is uh, let me just choose a different color here. So, let me say this is the d axis. So, it starts let us say this is the origin. So, 7 would be the same way and 2 it goes practically like this. I am sorry. So, 2 would move in the upward direction, it is parallel to the error voltage vector pertaining to that. So, for 2 its movement is like this, this is 0 sorry 7, this is 2 and when you apply 1 you come back here and when you apply 2 you go back here. So, this is 7 2 1 2 let me retrace the path here, this is 7, 2, this is 1, this is 2. 
7, 2, 1, 2. Here also you see that there is a the d axis ripple is smaller. Actually, the peak d axis ripples are equal in both the cases. In terms of the q axis ripple, also the peak q axis ripple in these cases are equal here and there. But the way the q axis falls, from here the q axis ripple falls a little faster, here the q axis ripple does not really fall that fast. So, you will find that the RMS q axis ripple in this case is a little higher than the RMS q axis ripple here. Therefore, I can actually write this in a similar fashion to before, you know, I can say that f 0 1 to 1 is actually less than f 7 to 1 to whenever alpha is less than 30 degrees and f 7 to 1 to is less than f 0 1 to 1 whenever alpha is greater than 30 degrees that is between 30 and 60 degrees. It is similar to what you found with 0 1 to 1 7 to 1 except that the difference here is not very high that is the difference between f 0 1 to 1 and f 7 to 1 to is not so high. So, therefore, what you find is here also you will have this is the worst scenario among the bus clamping PW methods which use 7 to 1 to 1 0 1 to 1. 7 to 1 to is worse of the 2 that is used in the first half 0 1 to 1 is the worse of the 2 in the second half. So, whereas this is the better of the 2 this is also the better of the 2 in that. So, this what we call as advanced bus clamping PWM 2 is slightly better than what is that I am saying slightly because it is really slightly if you work it out you will find that the improvement is not so high the distortion ball both the methods are very close to one another, but this is a little better the distortion is little lower than that. So, once you calculate the harmonic distortion like this based on the state of flux error voltage vector you integrate and you calculate the state of flux ripple vector and from this point what you can do is uh, you can uh, uh, write the expressions corresponding to the q axis ripple and the d axis ripple and you can square and integrate and uh, write down the expressions for the RMS state of flux ripple as we did for the conventional. Only for the conventional sequence we worked out the entire sequence and tried to do I mean we did in some greater detail. The same way you can write down you can come up with an expression for uh, the RMS uh, uh, um, uh, state of flux ripple over a sub cycle for any sequence now. Once you have that for any sequence, so this f sub is f sub square is the mean square value over a sub cycle for any given sequence. This will change, this will be f 0 1 2 7 you can say many things are there here. So, you can, so if you are considering 0 1 2 7 you may have some f 0 1 2 7, this is some function of VRF alpha and T s. Otherwise, you may have f 0 1 2, you may have f 7 2 1, you may have f 0 1 2 1 or f 7 2 1 2 depending on what sequence you use or it can also be f 1 0 1 2 or f 2 7 2 1. So, all for all these functions what you have is they are all uh, essentially functions of VRF alpha and T s all these are functions of VRF alpha and T s, but they are different functions particularly the coefficients C 0 and C 1 and C 2 that I talked of they are different for all these. Though. So, but nevertheless you have them as a function of VRF alpha and T s you are going to integrate it with respect to alpha over a sector that is 0 to pi by 3 and this is 3 by pi. So, this is the mean square value over a sub cycle this is the mean square value over the sector mean square value over the sector is same as the mean square value over the line cycle because in every sector it is symmetric. So, this is the mean square value over that and this F c is available for you as a function of VRF alpha and T s and you are going to integrate it with respect to alpha. So, once you have done that this is what you get this gives you your RMS current ripple this is the RMS state of flux ripple this RMS state of flux ripple is proportional to your RMS current ripple it is a measure of the RMS current ripple and as you have in THD in current THD what do we do we have the RMS current ripple we normalize it with respect to the fundamental current the same way what we can do is we can normalize this RMS state of flux ripple with respect to the fundamental flux and the fundamental flux is basically it is the fundamental voltage divided by omega. So, that is what I am trying to where omega is the fundamental angular frequency. So, you can do this and this you can call as f dist or what is called as a harmonic distortion factor. This harmonic distortion factor is actually a dimensionless uh, I mean it is independent of it is a dimensionless number it is independent of the machine parameters just like your weighted THD of the voltage waveform the weighted T uh, uh, so you can also see the similarity between this and the current THD. So, this is like the RMS current ripple and the fundamental current instead of RMS current ripple what you have is the RMS state of flux ripple and instead of the fundamental current what you have is the um, uh, you know fundamental uh, flux that is what you have now. And this actually numerically it will be very close to what you get with the weighted THT of the voltage waveform you have the voltage waveform and uh, you can get a measure of the current ripple by weighting all the fundamental uh, all the harmonic components you can take V n by n if V n is the nth harmonic V n by n you can do and sigma V n by n squared under root 
uh, that divided by V1. So, you have the weighted THD of the voltage which you derived and this number is actually kind of close to that now. And if you really do this, if you have integrated this, this alpha has gone out of that and what you are going to get is a, it is going to be a function of V ref and alpha, V ref and T s alone and you can actually get your V f dist as a function of V ref and T s. And this function will be different functions. So, I, I would probably say they are you know for, for example, for conventional this may be some function which I can call as G0127. For the other sequence it may be G012 or it may be G721 and so on. For, so, for different sequences you will get it as different functions of them. And if you are using you know again different not the same sequence between 0 to pi by 3 let us say uh, you are you, using some sequence to 0 to pi by 6 and some other sequence from pi by 6 to pi by 3 you can also do that integration suitably and you can come up with the harmonic distortion factor. So, you can finally, come up with a nice close form expression which will be something like you know k 1 v ref squared plus k 2 v ref cube plus k 4 v ref power 4 under root multiplied by v ref into T s and something like that is, is the kind of expression that you can get now. So, you can get the all details of this, it is very difficult to do all the derivations in a video lecture such as this, you can find several details of this now. So, for example, for the influence of switching sequences on current ripple which we found, these are some good papers which you can refer to. This advanced bus clamping PWM techniques based on space vector approach by in Narayanan, Krishnamurti, D Z and INR, this is in power electronics. This talks about the effect of 0, this uh, clamping sequences 0, 1, 2, 7 to 1 and also 0, 1, 2, 1 and 7 to 1, 2. This talks about the sequences now. And this thesis MS engineering thesis by Pawan Kumar Hari, which I mentioned a while back, is again a good reference uh, for understanding the influence of switching sequences. Here you will find for all the switching sequences like 0, 1, 2, 7 to 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 7 to 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2 and uh, 2721 for all the sequences which we are considering you will find them here now. And uh, again you can find the influence of switching sequences uh, you can study from these papers also which is space vector based uh, hybrid PWM techniques for reduced current ripple. This is published in the transactions on industrial electronics in April 2008. And then there is also another paper Zhao, Pawan Kumar and uh, et al. So, this is space vector based hybrid pulse width modulation techniques for reduced harmonic distortion and switching loss. Here the objective is to reduce the current ripple, here the objective is to reduce both distortion and switching loss, but some methods you know you can also get a good understanding of this from this here also. So, if you look at the analytical expressions, you can find the analytical expressions in a few different papers you now. This paper by Hava et al uh, gives you some analytical expressions for uh, for example, sine triangle PWM, conventional space vector PWM and bus clamping PWM methods. And uh, advanced bus clamp, you know here you will find for bus clamping as well as advanced bus clamping methods that is in Bhavsar, Tushar Bhavsar and Narayanan. This paper you will find that uh, this is again in transactions on power electronics. So, you have yet another paper uh, here, this is analytical evaluation of harmonic distortion in PWM AC drives using the notion of state of flux ripple. Here you will find for PWM methods, but these are synchronous PWM methods. So, they are uh, low switching frequency PWM methods. For such methods, analytical expressions are given in this paper. Right. So, if you have to do this, you can come up with a comparative thing of conventional and clamping sequence now. So, we looked at the individual ones. If you have to have a comparison, what we can do is, let us say, this is the reference vector you are talking of. So, these are plus minus minus plus plus minus your minus 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 and plus 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 0 1 2 7. So, these are the respective error voltage vectors. Now, let us say this is the d axis I mean this is the q axis and this is the d axis. So, if I do 0 1 2 7 if I do 0, 1, 2, 7, what I am going to get is, this is 0 and this is 1 and 2, sorry, So, I will have 0, 1, 2 and 7. This actually should be symmetric. Once again, excuse me. Yeah. 
So, this would be the conventional one. Let us say for this particular reference vector where V ref is the magnitude and let us say angle alpha. So, this side is parallel to the null vector, this is parallel to the error voltage vector 1, this is parallel to the error voltage vector 2 and 0, 1, 2, 7 if you do like this now. Instead if you do 0, 1, 2 what happens? You apply the 0 vector for the entire period the same 0 and you will get it like this 1 and 2. So, this is 0, this is 1 and this is 2. So, this is your flux circle vector. So, you can see that your flux circle vector increases now, particularly the q axis component is increased. In the earlier case the peak value of q axis was only half, now the q axis value is doubled. So, when you compare conventional and clamping sequences what you will find is the clamping sequences will kind of double the q axis voltage. So, that is why the error is very very high, I mean the q axis the harmonic distortion will increase, whereas the d axis ripple would not change now, but still it can happen now. But you what the difference you find is in the conventional you have 3 switchings whereas in the clamping sequence there are only 2 switchings. So, it is possible that you can reduce this sub cycle duration for the green thing by 2 thirds for the same average switching frequency. So, then it, this will get shrunk this triangle the green triangle will get shrunk by 2 thirds the values and if you do that then what you will find is at a higher modulation indices the green will be better than uh, red. The green is actually worse than red but if you reduce the sub cycle durations to 2 thirds you the green could become better than red at high modulation indices. So, this is a comparison of conventional clamping sequences bus clamping PW methods at high modulation indices can produce can you know you know reduce the THD over conventional PWM at high modulation indices. So, similar comparison you can also do for by the bus clamping methods. So, what you can do is if you take 0 1 to 7 now this is let us say is your I am doing it like this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, and this is 7. If you want to so this is the uh, so please understand that this is the a d axis and this is the q axis. So, instead if I do 0 1 2 1, so this 0 will double the q axis will increase, but 1 I am applying for half the time and 2 goes above and 1 brings it back. This is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 1. So, the d axis ripple the peak d axis ripple is half of what you get with here and therefore, this will reduce the RMS d axis ripple and this is advantageous under certain conditions. So, all this can actually be worked out to bring certain hybrid PWM techniques. So, you can actually consider something like sequences 0 1 to 1 here, 7 to 1 to here and 0 1 2 7 here. These are hybrid PWM methods you can discuss a lot of these hybrid PWM methods you will find them in papers. So, you will also find them as 1 0 1 2 here and 2 7 2 1 here and 0 1 2 1 7 here this is also another hybrid PWM method. I will discuss more of this when I deal with the uh, redu reduction in pulsating torque here I am just giving some references for you to follow about that if you need and when we discuss the torque pulsation at that time we will go get into this hybrid PWM method and do this at greater details. So, so, these are two methods uh, for just mint papers for you to look at now. So, thank you very much for this and in the next module we will take a pulsating torque and in the pulsating torque we will again do the evaluation of pulsating torque and how to design such hybrid PWM methods there we will discuss about both of them for reduction in current and also in torque. So, thank you very much.